nobility or the master morality is always the more fulfilling expression. The more you can express nobility, the happier, more fulfilled you are. Nobility assumes responsibility and therefore control of your reality. Obviously, none of us can control everything, right? We're not like, you can't just snap our fingers and make things happen. But if you're feeding resentful feelings, you're reinforcing this, this belief that your reality is out of your control. You're, you're reinforcing the feeling of being enslaved. The more you do things for other people, the more resentful you become ultimately, even if you think you're doing this for to be a good person or I'm gonna do this because I'm a good friend. If you're doing this mainly for their perceptions, you are giving away your power and you're increasing your resentment because it's actually nobody who constantly does things for other people is really happy. The nobleman chooses to enter battle. The nobleman chooses to take on challenges. The nobleman chooses to enter discomfort. Uh, they bring the fight. Whereas since the slave can't really compete, like they don't have the competence uh, to, they don't have the ability, they don't have the strength to actually uh, compete in the dominance hierarchy, they resent power, they resent competence, they resent anybody who has ability. A noble is one who has no separation between will and action. He can directly put his will into action. That is what nobility is. A nobleman, because of the fact that he assumes he's in control of his reality, always tells the truth. Last week I turned 33, and I wasn't planning on doing anything initially, I'm not a uh, party type, but the night before I turned 33, I was hanging out with some buddies, there's one guy we hang with who's much younger than the rest of us, he's actually one of my friend's employees, good guy, uh, he's maybe 10 years younger than me, and when it uh, came up that it was my birthday, he's like, oh, we gotta party, we gotta go out, we gotta celebrate, let's get drunk, whatever, and you know, it's very much not my thing. But then that night I was thinking, well, I only turned 33 once. Uh, you only get one birthday a year. It's symbolic of something. Maybe I should do something. And I thought, well, how do I want to enter thir my 33rd year? Should I, uh, should I treat myself to something? Should I sleep in? Should I do something comforting? And I was like, no, that's definitely not where I'm at. That's definitely not how I want to enter this new stage of my life, uh, particularly regarding family and fatherhood and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, well, how do I want to set myself up for this next chapter? And it was taking souls, a la David Gargans. I wanted to do something that is actually in line with how I want to behave uh, this next chapter of life. So I got up a little bit before dawn. I biked over to the mountain that uh, is nearby. I live in Chiang Mai. And I ran up the mountain, um, which is actually great. It's easier on my knees than running. Uh, on Flatland. It was interesting, um, my girlfriend and I have been speaking about uh, getting a dog this last, these last couple weeks. As soon as I arrived uh, on the mountain, these three little puppies just like ran down the mountain and like just hopped in my lap and it seemed like, oh, it's a sign, it's a sign from the universe, these are my dogs, I should take them all. There's three of them, a little bit more than I could, uh, than I would want to keep. But anyway, walked up the mountain, these three dogs like followed me, they were with me, it was like, we were like a little pack of four. I uh, could not run as fast as they could, but it was it was fun going up the mountain. I got up to the top of the mountain. There's a temple there. Did, did some journaling, did some pondering about life, thinking about my, my mortality, all that fun stuff. And um, there's one dog that, to be fair, was probably the least uh, interesting of the dogs, the most beta of the dogs. But this dog seemed like really, at least in my head, it really wanted me to take, uh, take her home. Um, you know, the other two dogs were kind of more rambunctious, a little more alpha. I could, I just imagine that this third dog, I'm sure they're all siblings, but this third dog, they're all puppies too. This, this more beta dog probably didn't get as much food, didn't get as much love. Um, so like, I just had this whole idea of like, oh, this is like kind of like the pathetic dog or the runt and like, it really needs me. And like, maybe I should take it home because it really needs me. And I was looking for a dog as kind of a sign. And I, and I came very close to doing that. Um, but then I realized I was journaling while I was pondering all this, thinking, you know, thinking on the page, which is why I think journaling is such a, an important thing. It clarifies your thoughts by putting them in a row, um, in coherent sentences at least. And I was like, wait a minute, this is exactly my old pattern with women. <laughs> Whereas if I'm uh, with a woman who seems to fit something that I think thought I asked for, but not exactly, but like they really need it. I mean, basically it was my Captain Sabaho thing 
that way that almost came out in dog form. So like, all right, not today, not today, uh, old nice guy patterns. Um, I'm not falling for this one. And that that had that, that kind of led me down another journaling path of like, okay, this is an old pattern that I've had in various many relationships and things that I haven't meant to do. Actually, if you uh, if you caught my episode last spring with Dr. Michael Pariser, uh, author of um, uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, The Hero's Journey. Uh, we we, he, we sp- kind of spent that episode analyzing me and this particular old uh, nice guy pattern that I still had, at least as of last year, where, you know, uh, when faced with a woman who uh, was kind of in a pathetic place and really need, seemed to need me, that, that would kind of pull on my heartstrings and I would go into Captain Say. But anyway, that, that's a separate topic. But this had me start to journal, okay, what are the things that I know for sure at 33? Or the things that I'm pretty sure I know, right? Like, I've spoken about this in, a, in some recent episodes of, it's important for every person to have a divergent period of their life where they're open to all sorts of new ideas, they're going to new locations, they're speaking to people they wouldn't normally speak to, they're breaking their old childhood patterns, which were maybe instilled into them by their reference group or their parents or whatever. And it's great to break all that, kind of enter like the fool archetype, kind of let all your patterns shatter and go explore, uh, whether physically or only in your mind, expose yourself to new things and like come up with new stuff. It's like kind of the whole diamond theory of you spend some time branching out, branching out, branching out. But at some point, it's important, especially if you want to mature, especially I'd say as a man, but I'm sure applicable to uh, women as well. You, You pick, you find out that you've, okay, I've explored enough things. The things I know about myself now, or think I know about myself, and it's time to like uh, narrow things back in, uh, hence the diamond. And um, so I started making this list. I started a list like this when I was 30, uh, another symbolic birthday. And I, what it came up with, it was specifically around this king archetype, this, this you know, entering, fa- like preparing for fatherhood, I should say. And, um, you know, reducing the globalness uh, idea of like br- bringing things down to like basically reducing my circle of thought and to, like con- converging instead of diverging, converging on the things that I know to be true or, or the principles that I believe enough to be true that I'm willing to stop questioning them and start living my life with more certainty. At some point you have to do that. Um, and I do want to also say, I don't think it matters at what age this is. I think in a re- recent episode, it was like, oh, you're supposed to branch out with it when you're young and then like converge when you're older. You know, if you spent your youth focused on one thing, let's say focused on making money, and then, then you realize, oh, shit, I want to explore the world. I think that's fine, too. You know, especially, you know, guys who get divorced, they kind of enter a new divergent stage. And it maps to our hormones, which I'll speak to later. Um, anyway, I made this whole list of um, basically... Instead of doing this, I will do that. Or, you know, I kind of had this like list of dichotomies. And a lot of it had to do with my social behavior or just behavior in general. And some of these, uh, this instead of that behaviors, were not necessarily even like the old behavior was necessarily bad, but there are certain behaviors, like such as branching out and exploring new things, that was maybe perfect uh, for when I was in my 20s, but not perfect for, for now. And I had this whole list. And I looked at this whole list. And if there was one thing that separated the, I want to do this now instead of that, which is maybe an old behavior or old way of thinking or old belief system, whatever, kind of came down to a topic I've been meaning to speak about anyway, which is Nietzschean nobility. Everything that I decided on this list of stuff of what I know at 33 that I want to do from now on kind of fell under the category of what Nietzsche would call master morality. And basically everything that I decided I was not going to do anymore, uh, it was not something that was serving me anymore, or maybe never was serving me, kind of fell under the category of what Nietzsche would call slave morality. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, master morality versus slave morality. And, uh, you know, these are charged terms, obviously, especially, you know, in modern context. Speak masters and slaves, people immediately think of race discussion or stuff like that. I'm gonna, That's not what we're talking about here. I... I know a lot of uh, writers who speak about Nietzschean nobility um, just avoid these terms, like uh, Jack Donovan in his books uh, uses the terms noble and anti-noble to just avoid the master and slave stuff. But I'm going to stick with Nietzsche's uh, real or his original uh, terms. I hope that everyone listening can read the context of what I'm speaking about, um, because ultimately we all have uh, both master archetypes and slave archetypes. I'm going to explain what these are in this episode. And they, just like all archetypes, 
Uh, they've evolved for certain purposes uh, in our ancestry, in, you know, in humanity. Um, they've become a part of the collective unconscious for a reason, survival purposes. And therefore, they're in us and they, they do drive our behavior in some ways. We all have both of these archetypes. I would argue, though, that uh, the more you're living in the master archetype, as an individual, the happier you are. And especially for men, uh, the master archetype is the archetype that leads to greater happiness, greater fulfillment, greater sense of personal power. Um, and the difference between these two things uh, is what... Nietzsche would call nobility. It's the qualities of the master archetype. Um, in this episode, we will speak on uh, the biological and anthropological, and I guess you could say sociological origins of these two archetypes. Speaking from like the actual class system of masters and slaves, this is just to get a sense of the origins of where these uh, driving forces or these personality traits or these senses of morality come from. This is not a comment on masters or slaves or that people should be one way or another or how society should necessarily be. Um, but I will say there are certain behaviors that a lot of people embody. I think most people embody uh, the slave archetype because our, our society has kind of been built around that. And a lot of people, not that you're literally enslaved, if you're watching this or listening to this, I assume you're a free person. But a lot of us uh, make choices based on slave morality that keep us enslaved in our minds or enslaved in some, some way that you're not living free as a person, as an individual person. So this quality of nobility, according to Nietzsche, is what allows that freedom, allows you to be more of a master of your reality, um, not a slave owner. Uh, and just to define this, nobility, according to Nietzsche, or at least my interpretation of this, is the assumption that your reality is within your control and therefore your responsibility. Um, my buddy Chris, who I have a lot of great discussions on this stuff with, uh, added this definition or this quality that the master archetype or the person embodying nobility does not have a separation between his will and his action, right? You can actually act on the, the locus of control of your life is within you. You can act on what you want. You can make things happen. You can make the dents in reality that you want. You can shape your world to be what you want. Whereas someone lacking nobility, someone who's deep in their slave archetype, has the general baseline assumption that their reality, their well-being is not within their control. There's something external that dictates their fate. Uh, you know, this, this idea of the master, but as I said, even if you're not a literal slave, most of us, many people in society embody this slave archetype, assuming there's something outside of them that dictates whether they're happy or not. So uh, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything in this definition. Uh, yeah, even though we don't have literal masters, many of us have created a like a some or you know play out this master slave dynamic in a not uh, empowering way. And actually, I'll say uh, to tie to many other topics that we've spoken about, this uh, whole idea of nice guy syndrome, uh, you know, the whole beta male thing, or this. Uh, I assume you know what nice guy syndrome is. Nice guy syndrome is essentially an evolution off of slave morality. In fact, in one sense, you could say that slave morality is kind of like the precursor or has laid the foundation for nice guy syndrome. Slave morality uh, assumes that you have to do things for other people outside of you who dictate your fate. So like nice guys assume, nice guys assume that if I make myself harmless enough, women will like me or people will like me because like anybody who's capable of harm, anyone who has power is obviously bad. Like that's kind of the slave morality uh, it's one of the slave morality uh, ideas. Um, of course, we know that's not true. Uh, and in terms of sexual dynamics, no one's really attracted to the nice guy, uh, even though you think, okay, you, you might think he's nice. Uh, no one respects the nice guy because of the fact that he's harmless. So in embodying nobility, we don't want to be harmless. And I just want to reiterate again, because this is an, is an important point. Uh, we all have both archetypes and it's not and towards the end of this episode I'll speak why it's important to have both you know if you were to somehow completely delete your slave archetype that's not necessarily a good thing either um, the slave slave archetype is the drive to be accepted the drive to be a part of a homogenous group which obviously has negative connotations or negative effects but you don't want to eradicate that completely um, but I will say and I'll just you know, nail this home before we jump in uh, all masculine development centers around embodying nobility. And I'll go as far to say, I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this episode. Basically, I think every, uh, every 
prescription, every suggestion I've ever given men on this podcast falls under the category of nobility. And everything that I've uh, argued against, like nice guys behaviors or whatever, uh, kind of falls under the category of slave morality, or at least uh, can be justified by slave morality. So this episode, we're going to have three parts. I'm going to speak briefly on the, I don't know how brief it'll be, honestly, on the biological and anthropological origins of these archetypes, just so we get a sense of like why these dual moralities exist in our consciousness today. We're going to switch to the second part. We're going to speak about the archetypal qualities, like what actually goes on in our unconscious, in our minds, um, and the differences between embodying these two sets of characteristics. And finally, we'll speak about practical application and how to actually embody nobility in your real life. I'm not saying that we all go out and like become slaveholders. I become that. I'm saying that we we can embody these traits in our daily lives and how we behave and uh, hold ourselves to uh, live in a noble way and have control over our reality and uh, feel better in our lives. Um, Nietzsche often synonymizes nobility with happiness, and I would agree, especially for men. And I'll add one thing at the end. Um, because as we speak about this, I mean, this could be a controversial episode, depending on your political leanings, or if, you know, just like, you know, if you're deep in nice guy syndrome, you might feel upset when you listen to my nice guy syndrome episodes. It, it can feel, depending on where you're at, it, some of it might feel harsh. Um, same thing in this episode, it could be controversial if you're, d definitely if you're like, if you lean in that direction politically. I'm going to try to avoid politics or political commentary, but th this could feel like a controversial episode, mainly because a lot of what we would call nobility um, seems like selfishness. And actually, in many ways, it is. In fact, uh, anybody fighting against their nice guy syndrome or anybody just uh, developing better boundaries, there is an argument against both of those things, uh, which is well, it seems like you're being selfish. Like when someone has good boundaries, you're like, ah, oh, it's easy to criticize them. Of like, oh, this person who says they have good boundaries, they're just being selfish. Or this person who's trying to not be a nice guy, he's kind of just being a douchebag now. That's not the point, but it can seem that way. And actually Nietzsche would argue that uh, this idea that selfishness is necessarily bad comes purely from slave morality, right? Once upon a time before the rise of slave morality, which uh, kind of goes, uh, I mean, it became really prominent with the rise of uh, monotheism, particularly Christianity. Um, prior to that, selfishness wasn't necessarily seen as a bad thing. Like, it's kind of a recent uh, ethic that selfishness is bad. Anyway, we're going to speak about that. But I'm going I'm to share one key on what prevents you from being an asshole while uh, embodying nobility. Before we jump in, I don't really have any big announcements. If you're watching the video, you may notice that I did finally upgrade um, my background. We have the black sound panels. We're back in black. I do need to straighten them out, but neither here nor there. That's not really an announcement. <clears throat> anyway, jumping in. So first is uh, the origins in bi biology. So all of our behaviors come from, uh, or originally come from gene competition. Our, the replicating matter that makes up our DNA has a tendency to replicate. Natural selection, I'm sure you're familiar with many episodes running through this. As, uh, as life evolved, so we'll just skip ahead all the way to mammals. Mammals organize, and, and birds and some other uh, creatures, many different creatures, even lobsters, as Jordan Peterson likes to share, uh, fall into dominance hierarchies. Dominance hierarchies determine the order of resource distribution, and, which includes food, um, in species where there's male-male competition, it also uh, uh, is the other resources, uh, wombs, sex, eggs, another uh, scarce resource. And uh, for pre-conscious beings, for, for non-human animals, obviously they don't have a sense of morality. Morality is a, it's a sapient quality. But uh, this idea of good, in quotes, is anything that promotes survival. Anything that's bad is anything that threatens survival. So obviously, lobsters, mammals, orangutans, whatever, uh, birds, they don't have a sense of morality, but they do have certain tendencies of what feels good and what feels bad. Typically, anything that's harming you or harming your offspring, preventing your genes from passing on, it just feels bad. You know, we've evolved that way. Any animal that evolved uh, to feel good about smashing its head against the wall probably didn't live very long. Those genes did not pass on. Uh, and you know anything that promoted survival of yourself and your offspring felt good. Uh, that 
passed on and those became the prominent uh, behaviors in the gene pool. Uh, so one of the things, especially for males, <clears throat> that promote survival is, uh, especially with, uh, say, mammals and, and birds as well, uh, species where there's a lot of male-male competition rather than purely sperm competition, um, is this willingness and ability to fight. The dominance hierarchy in uh, most mammal species is determined by male-male competition. So an extreme would be two gorillas fighting over who gets the harem of females or two elephant seals or whatever. Um, and this is largely driven by hormones, steroid hormones uh, being testosterone and cortisol. A steroid hormone is a hormone that affects your entire body. Uh, steroid hormones can typically permeate cell walls. They affect the structures of your body. Um, I mean, as we know in, uh, in sports, uh, steroid hormones can give a huge boost. I mean, particularly testosterone. Anabolic steroids can give a huge boost to uh, the growth of muscle and stuff. Um, there's catabolic hormones like cortisol. Anabolic is building up. Cat catabolic is breaking down. Um, and these two hormones, uh, testosterone and cortisol, are kind of the hormones of winners and losers. Um, I've spoken about this in other episodes, but I'll, I'll briefly recap uh, the winner effect. When someone enters competition, this is true for humans too, let's say two gorillas or two rams butting heads, one wins, one loses, the winner gets a boost in testosterone. This is known as a winner effect. This is why, uh, you know, uh, if you've competed in things and you win, it feels good. Even if you're playing a board game, even if it's something that obviously doesn't really matter, or even if you're watching sports and you're rooting for one team and your team wins, you get a boost of testosterone and dopamine. Your body also produces more androgen receptors in response to that testosterone, so you feel better the next time you win. You feel even more, uh, more interested in winning. You're more willing and, a, willing and able to fight. Uh, testosterone also gives you a strength boost. This makes sense in the wild because if you just had a male-male competition, let's say you're a ram, you just defeated one challenger, you're probably going to get another challenger. This boost in testosterone also makes you more horny, so you should you know, uh, take advantage of your win, mate as much as you can, and prepare for the next battle, whatever time frame that is. The loser experiences uh, what's known as a loser effect. His testosterone drops, making him feel less strong and less willing to battle, which makes sense. If you've already lost to a stronger competitor, there's no sense in fighting more. Uh, you're best off for your own survival, uh, retreating uh, somewhere else, healing, maybe competing again in the future, but certainly right after you lose, you should not want to compete again. So, you know, if you, uh, if you just lost some, some sort of battle, uh, you, you feel bad. Even playing a board game, which maybe you know, obviously you shouldn't take those things too seriously, but it doesn't feel it feels good to win. It doesn't feel good to lose. We all know this. <clears throat> Depending on the type of loss, your body will also produce a lot of cortisol. Cortisol being a catabolic steroid, a stress the stress hormone um, to to get you away, just in case you're you're still in danger. Get you away from the predator. Get you away from uh, the the competitor who just defeated you. Um, Cortisol is only supposed to be in our bodies for a short period of time to, to aid with inflammation, to get us away, to not be interested in risk. When our cortisol levels are high, we become more risk averse. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's doing this for the sake of preservation. And testosterone and cortisol, as I mentioned in the Winter Effect episodes, uh, they have the same precursor hormone, DHEA. So if your body's producing a lot of cortisol, it's actually using up the raw material that you would make testosterone, which is why if you lose a lot, you actually feel less manly. When you win, you do feel manly. Uh, this has been shown, we all know this, right? We, most of us have experienced something like this uh, anecdotally that supports this, probably. Um, so catabolic steroids, like, like cortisol, deplete, depletes our long-term stores of energy for the sake of immediate survival. Um, whereas testosterone builds things up. Testosterone is for, uh, uh, you know, allows us to breed better. Cortisol is like, cortisol will deplete our reproductive system, deplete certain energy systems for the sake of getting us away and surviving. If, if a guy or a person is, is uh, producing a lot of cortisol over a long period of time, um, as a lot of people do due to their stressful jobs, for instance, their stressful jobs where they do not control their fate, as most corporate jobs are, uh, you're basically, it's kind of like you're running for a predator nonstop, right? Our bodies aren't built for that because in the wild, if you're running from a predator, 
um, you either get away and you're safe and you can switch back to producing testosterone and like not producing cortisol, chilling out, rebuilding, or you get eaten, right? Which is why the body's willing to sacrifice everything else to get away because it doesn't matter if you uh, have any other stores of energy if you just got eaten. Um, but a lot of people, as I've just mentioned, produce cortisol way longer than they're supposed to, you know, they way longer than an immediate threat. And this causes low sex drive, this causes feeling shitty. I mean, we all, we all know this, the, the effects of long-term stress. Now, one of the things that cause cortisol release is uncertainty or the, the perception that you do not control your situation. Um, and in the, the book, the hour, of, the hour Between Dog and Wolf, where some of this information is coming from, um, he shares all these experiments about how um, if you, uh, you, you, know, you put mice in a situation where they, uh, where they don't, um, where they don't have control over their environment, eventually they'll stop acting stressed. They'll stop, uh, you know, they'll stop like frantically looking around. Eventually they'll chill out. You're, you don't stay in that state for long, but their body will still produce cortisol. It's like their pre, their pre-aware self, their pre-behavioral self is still aware that it's in a, in a bad situation. It's still depleting its, uh, uh, ability to produce testosterone, for instance. Um, this is all to say that there's a hormonal basis to the dominance hierarchy. It's something that's pre-conscious. Skipping ahead through our evolutionary uh, span into humans, into the anthropological side. Social humans, uh, we're also mammals. We do form dominance hierarchies, but we, we take it a step further. Um, we're a particularly social species. And, um, you know, in the Paleolithic era, the human tribes, you know, were able to work collectively. They stayed b beneath Dunbar's number. They were smaller than 150. Um, 150 people in a tribe. Um, they were connecting uh, based on uh, limbic bonds, uh, you know, that, that sense of belonging. And still, in, in this era, we were still pretty close to our pre-conscious uh, ancestors, our animalistic, our animal ancestors, non-human ancestors, where we can infer from the Paleolithic consciousness, the, pale, the caveman's consciousness, good and bad, while now we're socially enforced, we're still based on survival, right? Um, we, we do know that our Paleolithic ancestors did have sense of culture, they did make art, they were communicating um, with some, some language, um, but still their senses of morality, what was good was what promoted survival, maybe group survival, certain traits were uh, socially reinforced as good because they helped the group survival. Certain traits were now socially reinforced as bad because they harmed group survival. And the survival traits, let's say for men, but really for all beings, strength and courage, the willingness uh, to serve the tribe and do hard things and the ability to, to, to serve the tribe were universally good, right? Especially for males, um, because the, you know, when the women were pregnant, the responsibility of protecting and providing would fall on those with more muscle who didn't get pregnant, which were the males. As humans uh, continue to evolve, or I should say human society evolved into the Neolithic era, we started planting stuff. This allowed uh, settlements to grow beyond 150. We no longer were connecting just limbically. We had to connect via mythology, as, uh, as uh, Harari speaks about in Sapiens. And from here onwards into the Bronze Age and as civilization progressed, we do see the development of some sort of class system, which is kind of a, uh, a more human take on the dominance hierarchy. With pre-conscious animals, if you observe dogs, the dominance hierarchy is basically, I mean, it's, it's, as we speak about with chickens, there's a pecking order. It's just an order of who dominates whom. In a, in a human society, this dominance hierarchy just like adds dimensions that become more complex with uh, how different classes should behave. And in general, uh, as we can see, certainly by the Bronze Age, um, there's at least two classes of nobles and peasants. One of the origins of these two basic classes was that um, as, uh, as settlements developed wealth, which, can only, which only was able to happen once they became agrarian or agricultural rather, some tribes, let's say, let's say the typical Vikings or barbarians or whatever, would, would swoop in, would conquer the people because Vikings focused on warfare, whereas maybe some other say, Northern European uh, group focused on building wealth. Um, the Vikings would come in and conquer. The conquerors would, would uh, become the noble class because they controlled everything through force. And the conquered people, which probably had their own nobility, they had their own chief at one point, they were all subjugated to a lower class of laborers. So you had these conquerors who were powerful, were mighty, they were the ones with the military force, uh, 
And they basically pimped out this lower class, the conquered people who became peasants, who now had to serve their masters by providing their wealth. And this is where we had the split, because prior to this merging of uh, two different groups into one, where one becomes the noble class and one, beco one becomes the subjugated class, everyone lived on this uh, pre-conscious idea of good and bad, which is good is what's good for our survival, bad is what's bad for our survival. The conquerors were still able to maintain this, this type of morality, whereas the conquered people no longer were free. They no longer interfaced directly with nature the way the conquering people or the pre-conquered people behaved. Their well-being was not directly in relation to nature or reality. Their well-being was determined by the conquered people's desires, right? So that they no longer directly interfaced with the world. They interfaced with the world through their masters, right? And you imagine like uh, in pure slavery, obviously the slave isn't free to do his own things or make decisions for his own well-being. His decisions or his well-being is kind of determined by what the master decides. This is what we see uh, once we had conquered tribes. Uh, so they're, they're, they had a new morality, which is essentially what we could call slave morality, where since they no longer di directly interface with nature, their good and bad no longer applies. They're, you know, what's good for their survival is kind of determined by what the master sets. It's kind of like instead of having like an instinctual or, or natural uh, reality, or instead of being able to follow their instincts on what good and bad is based on how uh, animals evolved to seek survival and avoid death, when enslaved, they had to enter the kind of this artificial reality where instead of good and bad, in the way that uh, animals see it, or animals, you know, on some level perceive it, they had this new definition of good, which is good is whatever allows the master to treat me well, or, or allows the master to, you know, give me some sort of uh, positive experience. And evil is now anything that causes the master uh, to harm me, or, or causes harm to me. So instead of uh, to to the conquerors. Good typically was strong and bad was weak, right? Strong men uh, promote survival, weak men uh, reduce our chances of survival. From the slave's perspective, good became harmless. Good actually became weak, it became reversed. And evil became anyone with the capacity to harm me. And, um, and you can see uh, there's a split. There's a split in morality, there's a split in uh, definitions and actually kind of this flip of what the definition of a good is. And we can see that based on slave morality, for the same survival reasons, a slave would, uh, most people in a slave situation, most slaves, had a better chance of surviving by becoming weaker and meeker and more harmless. And anything that made them more mediocre, uh, made them less threatening, became what be the definition of being a good man was. So you see this switch. And we can see, like, maybe this is, perhaps this is the origin of nice guy syndrome, and where there's this idea that if I become harmless and not threatening and completely average and not spectacular in a way that no one no one even considers me that's my way to get through the world <clears throat> so slave morality sees, sees that a good man is harmless and we can see you know um because of the fact that it is now a divergence from nature this is one of the reasons why uh women are not attracted to nice guys if we, if we roll things back into like our animalistic instincts which no matter what our culture puts on us our instincts are still determined by our biological evolution even even in a world completely dominated by the assumptions of slave morality women are still attracted to men who don't embody that women are still attracted to strong men because because of uh, biology because of sexy son hypothesis right um, uh, no, on an instinctual level, no woman wants to procreate with a weak man because even though he's harmless and will perhaps survive under the master, uh, the woman would rather be is more attracted to the master, right? Uh, a weak man is going to have weak sons. A weak son in a in a free sexual marketplace will not uh, attract mates, so then her genetic line will uh, end, which is why women are not attracted to nice guys, right? It's not a good uh, genetic bet to spend your egg on. Uh, a guy who's a slave, right, or who embodies slave characteristics. <clears throat> so here we can move on to uh, the archetypal side or psychological side, because this everything I just said so far was just to show the origins um, of why master morality and slave morality, what they are and why they exist in our collective unconsciousness. And I just want to reiterate, we all have both archetypes, right? In fact, if you go through your genetic line, 
uh, go, go way back or maybe maybe not so far back, depending on, uh, on your lineage. You probably have both literal masters and literal slaves in your, uh, in your genetic line. I did uh, the 23andMe thing a couple years ago, and uh, my female side, or my mom's side of the family, it's mostly Filipino genes, but there's a little bit of European, which is probably the conquistadors who came uh, into the Philippines with Marco Polo and perhaps raped uh, some of my great-great-great uh, 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 ancestors. Um, and so I have a little bit of both, right? We all have a little bit of both. In fact, most peoples, I mean, if you look more, re I mean, if you look at, uh, say, England, for instance, the noble class and the peasant class were basically formed by conquering peoples. Uh, when the conqueror came in, uh, his people became the noble class. Everyone who perhaps used to be, uh, I'm forgetting the, the king who was conquered, his people became subjugated. Uh, they became the peasant class. This is, and you know, English people have a little bit of both, probably, right? There's lots of mixing. So we have these both in our genetic lines. We have this both in our collective unconsciousness because both of these archetypes have influenced how society has developed. Um, in the recent century, there's been like a swing towards more slave morality, which has not been a bad thing, uh, as we'll speak about. Mass morality has been, uh, you know, imperialism has been an example of like extreme mass morality, like our peoples are better and other peoples are not worth it. They're, they're there to serve us. Obviously, that's led to negative things. There were plenty of slave revolts, including, say, um, the American Revolution was American. The American colonies were an enslaved people to a sense. They were in the slave role. Uh, they fought back. Anyway, this is all to say that we have both in ourselves. And this is not to say that... Anyway, I'm not trying to make a sociological argument. I am trying to make a psychological argument that you as an individual, all of us, will be a lot happier embodying nobility rather than uh, acting as slaves, essentially. Just to redefine this again, nobility or the master morality is always the more fulfilling expression. The more you can express nobility, the happier, more fulfilled you are. And the definition, as far as what we care about here, is that nobility assumes responsibility and therefore control of your reality, right? If you're assuming that the locus of your well-being is outside of yourself, if you're assuming that someone else determines your fate, this is obviously a very disempowering way to live. Uh, and that is, that is slave morality. <clears throat> So I'm going to run through a little bit here some of the differences in the expressions of master morality and slave morality. So on a the one political bit I'll share. So on a socio-political uh, perspective, uh, master morality, a lot of the things that determine good for um, someone in a master role and a master archetype is conservation of status or like uh, the increase of power. Right, the master is still free, or someone who's not enslaved is still free to compete for top dog, right? So if you look at, uh, look at let's say medieval history, like in, in the feudal times in feudal Europe, that was kind of an extreme of master morality um, where uh, every Lord like had dominion over his own uh, feudal uh, lands. Um, and they all believed in, and they were all able to compete for higher status. Whereas obviously the slave is not free to compete, right? The slave is, is, is just trying to, just hoping to survive being at the bottom of the pyramid. Or not even within the pyramid, right? They're not even technically in the dominance hierarchy of a given society. So we can see, uh, you know, this is perhaps uh, some people consider this controversial, but you know, this is the origin of conservative politics and liberal politics. Conservative politics wants to conserve status because if you are in the ruling class or the, the privileged class, if you will, you want to do things, you want to enact policies or you want to enact laws or you want to live by ethics that conserve your status, which makes sense, right? If, you're, if your family's in power, your fam you want to keep your family in power. So where, where we see in conservative politics, even though this is not necessarily true today, like there's plenty of poor people who uh, vote Republican, uh, there's plenty of rich people who uh, you know follow liberal politics, conservative politics still follow of revering tradition and um, Autonomy, right? They want small governments. They want free markets. They they believe in uh, they revere the the people that came before them. American Republicans all revere uh, Ronald Reagan. They like looking back and like and, and like praising the champions of the past, which comes comes from a time where your people, your family was the conquering family, the conquering people, and you want to like ensure that everyone knows that, like, oh, my great grandfather conquered these lands, and that's why. I deserve to be king or duke of this land or whatever, right? <clears throat> Whereas on the slave side, or I should say, say I mean, 
I don't mean to connect slavery with liberal politics, but it, is, it does make sense, right? Uh, poor people or pe- poor, uh, you know, less, uh, less privileged people tend to vote left, uh, lean left uh, or vote liberal. Because if you are in the subjugated class, whether literally or figuratively, anything, anything new is better, right? You don't care so much about tradition because tradition is what's led you to be in the, in the, in the, less, uh, in the more impoverished, impoverished state, right? So liberals seek progress. Um, they are pro-assistance. Like anything that's new uh, is better because if, if you're in a shitty state, then you just, you just want change, right? Liberals want change, progression. Conservatives distrust foreigners because um, they and they, they want to preserve resources and keep things internal. Just like in feudal Europe, it was actually seen as a bad thing to trade because if you were if you were, um, if you needed to trade outside of your estate, it meant that you weren't able to produce everything you needed, and that was seen as a bad thing in feudal Europe. Whereas now, you know, the world is a lot more uh, global. A country is seen as good if they're able to trade a lot, right? There's been a switch towards uh, left leaning, which makes sense, you know, from a uh, if you're in, a, in the commoner's class, in the working man's class, again, anything new is probably going to be an improvement. Finally, uh, you know, uh, in a financial level, uh, fiscal level, conservatives like to do anything that preserves wealth, so low taxes. Uh, they want to reward competition, free markets, whereas liberals uh, tend to want to distribute wealth because they see it's like, oh, like we're all the common people. We need to make things more fair. Uh, they're seeking equality. Um, and they're often seeking relief, let's say, from the government because there's this assumption of like life is suffering. You know, the Buddhist uh, phrase is kind of from a slave, ar- so slave archetype perspective, right? Life is only suffering if you're a slave, right? If you're, if you're a king, it's kind of hard to argue that life is suffering. Um, perhaps it is on some spiritual level still. But th- this, these are the origins of these two political sides. And, you know, I just want to say, like, even though I'm speaking on behalf of uh, nobility, I do lean left on most most issues. I don't think all of this is good, even though. Uh, anyway, this is just this is just illustrating, right? So now if we switch to, uh, let's say, from a purely master archetype or the noble view of things. What is the best way to spend your time? What's a master's pastime? And I think you know, Joe Rogan is a great ex- example of this. Like he's constantly saying, "Do hard things, conquer your inner bitch." And if you look at say like, like a guy like that or anyone who resonates with that kind of thing like a David Goggins or or any of us, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, maybe you, you, you as well. The best thing you could do with your time is something challenging that you chose yourself, right? And, and I think this is especially true for men. Um, you know, obviously there is a dopamine uh, release and like there's pleasure from doing easy things like playing video games or sitting on your ass or watching porn or binging on Netflix. There is, there, there is of course, everyone finds pleasure in that because we have a slave archetype too. But there's something extra fulfilling or long-term fulfilling about doing something kind of the opposite of like, you know, say running up a hill on your birthday before dawn instead of sleeping in, right? There's something that feels like archetypally masculine and fulfilling on some level. Um, where, whereas, I mean, I, I was tempted, honestly, to sleep in on my birthday. It's not like I never sleep in um, because we also have that comfort seeking too. And this, you know, if you look at, uh, someone who has total freedom in their work versus someone who is more enslaved in their work. What do totally free entrepreneurs, I mean, I should say like someone who's like totally free to do whatever they want, what do they typically do with their time that is fulfilling? They take on a challenge. You think, let's say Joe Rogan goes out and hunting with his buddies, um, whereas uh, someone who's like enslaved by a job, their ultimate pastime might be doing nothing. Right, going on vacation, sitting on the beach, sipping Mai Tais, doing nothing. Right? It's not to say that comfort is bad, but that is satisfying more the slave archetype than the master archetype. Because if you have total freedom, you don't need to find relief from anything. Right? If you're the king of the land and everyone's pr- providing you with wealth, you go out and choose to go hunting. You go out and choose to go jousting or, or fighting your friends for fun. You go out on battles for the sake of glory. Whereas the peasant, wants any opportunity to have relief. You know, like the, 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 whole, the whole core of liberalism, let's say, is that there's an assumption that you're not free, so you're seeking liberality, you're seeking freedom. Whereas if you're assuming you're free, you kind of just wanna, well anyway, conservativeness is conserving your wealth, conserving your power. Because um, the noble assumes, the nobility assumes that you have agency. Uh, so the sl- slave morality assumes that you're not free. So you're seeking freedom, you're seeking relief from life, whereas the noble is, act, is uh, excited to get to do things, right? 
Which brings us to our next thing about the perception of adversaries, uh, which is uh, brings us to a very uh, key point with Nietzschean nobility, which is resentment, uh, relates to resentment. So I'll start with the no noble. The noble, and this is something that he shares in his, uh, Nietzsche shares in his uh, one of his essays in the Genealogy of Morality, only a noble can really respect, honor, and love his adversary, right? Because the master needs other masters to do battle with. They, they need other masters to be a worthy adversary so they can ensure their own uh, qualities of strength, honor, and courage, right? The master respects his uh, adversary and loves his adversary in the heat of battle. I mean, you can see this in MMA a lot where like two uh, really, I mean, fighting is a noble quality. Choosing the fight is a noble quality. Um, even when there's a lot of beef between two fighters, a lot of shit talkers, uh, they usually hug afterwards, you know, and they say it's all respect, all love because of the fact that they fought. Like they respect each other because they just beat each other up, right? And because of the master, because uh, the master needs that, he loves his adversary. Whereas since the slave can't really compete, like they don't have the competence uh, to, they don't have the ability, they don't have the strength to actually uh, compete in the dominance hierarchy, they resent power, they resent competence, they resent anybody who has ability. And we can see this in um, the collective culture these days where there's this huge attack on anyone with power. Like this assumption that if you have power, you're bad because you must have done something bad to gain that power, which maybe, honestly, maybe is true on some level. Even if you go all the way back, the noble classes, the Queen of England even, is the Queen of England because her ancestors fucked people up centuries ago or whatever that was. I don't know. I don't know Queen Elizabeth's lineage exactly, but that, that means that that is not, not, it's not a false belief from the commoner's perspective of like, oh, privileged people must have done something harsh to us. Could be true. Um, but in, in, in uh, the immediate sense, in like your individual sense, which is what we really care about, this resentment is not empowering, right? I spoke about this in many episodes, including the magician, archi magician archetype episode, which is if you're resentful at someone, you're giving them power, right? To, in order to be resentment, resentful at someone, in order to blame someone, in order to complain about something, you have to believe in the assumption that that thing has control over reality, right? And obviously, none of us can control everything, right? We're not like, you can't just snap our fingers and make things happen. But if, you, if, you're, if you're feeding resentful feelings, you're reinforcing this, this belief that your reality is out of your control. You're, you're reinforcing the feeling of being enslaved, right? Which is not good for anybody. And, uh, you know, if you, if you Google the French word, resentment, uh, with the two S's, uh, the first thing that usually pops up, at least on Google, is uh, the Nietzschean sense of the word, right? Like, in, if, you, if you Google this or, you know, anybody speaking about this is like, resentment is not exactly the same thing as resentment. The way Nietzsche uses it, it's like a, a hatred of, or blame of something external that causes uh, your hardship. But I would actually argue that, at least in the way, let's say, resentment is spoken about in something like the 12-step program, which is, you know, a very practical application of uh, monotheism in my, in my view, they actually kind of remind people to not be resentful. And actually, uh, some of my friends who are in recovery have said to me, like, all addiction is caused by resentment, right? Like that's what resentment is what causes you to feel isolated. The isolation is what causes you to abuse some some uh, substance of choice or activity of choice. Um, because actually, the slave, of course, uh, resents the master for their fate, but the master doesn't necessarily resent the slave, right? And Nietzsche uses uh, an animal um, example with eagles and lambs. Uh, I believe it's eagles. Some bird of prey and lambs. Some bird that eats lambs. I think it was eagles. And he's he saying that lambs obviously hate the eagles, right? The lambs think that the eagles choose to be eagles and they choose to be carnivores and like they're terrorizing this because they're evil. They choose this, right? But the eagles don't hate the lambs because the eagles are not threatened by the lambs at all. The eagles actually love the lambs. The eagles are like, oh, lambs are super tasty. I love lambs, right? And they, and they like that. And this, uh, and you know, we can even see this uh, in The Lion King where Simba and Nufasa are speaking about... Um, antelopes and I forget the pre-dialogue but Simba says something like but well, don't we eat the antelopes speaking about respect and Mufasa says the famous line when we die our bodies become the grass and the antelopes eat the grass and therefore is the um, is the circle of life like the 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 noble predator loves and respects even 
his uh, even the peasants, right? Doesn't mean that he wants to lift all the peasants up necessarily because he just accepts the reality of things. We're going to speak about this at the end with Noblesse Oblige. But Nietzsche actually says, you know, I actually one thing I forgot to mention in the origins is that one of the major rises, uh, or the you know the what, one thing that has allowed the prominence of slave morality is monotheism. I actually spend a whole episode. I mean, this idea of Nietzschean nobility is a major theme in my History of Masculinity series, which is coming out later this year. Um, but like, you know, these, this dual morality has affected warfare and perceptions of masculinity, which is why I talk about a lot. But one of the huge um, advancements of uh, slave morality into the collective consciousness came with the rise of monotheism, specifically Christianity. Because if you look at... Um, if you look at, let's say, the Old Testament versus the New Testament, the Old Testament is very mass morality, right? The whole fire and brimstone stuff. A lot of the, a lot of the Old Testament stories seem like really harsh, like, man, God is an asshole, right? But it's kind of reflecting the nature of nature, whereas the strong are typically rewarded, right? Whereas in the New Testament, you have all this stuff kind of like, um, it's kind of more from a slave's perspective. And, you know, Jesus was obviously a, a peasant, a lot of his lines like turn the other cheek or like the idea of like the meek will ha- um, inherit the earth or uh, a rich man can get into heaven. Uh, I forget the line, but more easily than a camel can pass through the eye of a needle. I, I, I botched that, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Like this idea that wealth and power is bad, whereas like suffering is good. This comes from, this is supported by slave morality, right? This idea that, you know, everyone wants to see themselves as the good guy. So the noble sees himself as like, I'm good because I'm strong. We are good because we're strong. Um, the slave has to flip that around of like, we are good morally because we're not strong, right? The, and then slave morality rewards weakness or mediocrity um, because of this. Uh, so if you look at stuff like, uh, even like cancel culture, this, this hate of uh, people in power, this is slave morality coming out. And uh, Nietzsche says, uh, I brought monotheism because Nietzsche says that priests are the most hateful people, people who choose to be priests. This is his words. I'm not saying this is what I believe because uh, they are adding to this, this uh, flip of definitions that strong means evil, um, which is kind of what Christianity did uh, during its rise. Ironically, once Christianity became a prominent force in Europe, it started to embody mass morality as like... Uh, Enacting this, enacting the Crusades, which is essentially a master morality idea of like, oh, our religion is the best religion. Let's conquer everyone else, which is ironic, given that Christianity came from this idea of respecting all people and loving your brother and loving your enemy, even all that stuff. Finally, uh, well, two two last things. Uh, going to selfishness, and, and Nietzsche speaks about this in the beginning of his book, The Genealogy of Morality, in that uh, with egotism, right. Now, now most of us view like having an ego as a bad thing. Like slave morality is kind of uh, incepted into us that uh, serving yourself or serving your people must be bad, right? And I spoke about uh, Cersei Lannister um, is one of like my favorite villains, Cersei Lannister in Game of Thrones, because she is pretty much like the most evil character. Like she does some pretty nasty things, but she does this for her family, right? She does this in service of her line. She might do this in a, an overly cruel way. Not necessarily a noble way, but she is, you know, this is, anyway, I, this is a, a tangent I don't need to go on necessarily, but uh, the master seeks to glorify himself and like uh, promote his lineage and genetic line. The slave uh, seeks mediocrity because it, it, it's this idea that we all need to be equally low, right? And this is one of the, criti- this is the, one of the um, criticisms of socialism of like, yes, we can all be equal, but we'll all be poor together, right? That's not necessarily good. Whereas, uh, the conservative argument against this, which is not necessarily true in action or, you know, not always true. Whereas if you allow for competition, you allow for stratification, yes, they're going to be, there's going to be people who have more than others, but that competition allows everyone to have more. So even in a, in a super stratified society, the, the poorest people are still richer than the equals of a purely socialist society. I'm not saying that's true or not. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than just saying that. But finally, bring this back to like our individual expression and what I really care about is truth. The master is always high fidelity. The master is also uh, true with his word, right? Uh, that's a, always been a noble ethic to be true to your word uh, and honorable. Mainly because if you are really the master of your domain, if you really are the conquering people, there's no reason to lie, right? You're in control of everything. So why would you ever 
waste your energy deceiving people, right? Whereas if you're in a more slavish uh, role where you're uh, you know, subject to other people's whims, now you have a real incentive to lie and be manipulative and be fake and pretend to be meek or bow when you don't really care to. Like, you know, you might show fake shows of respect just to survive. It makes sense, right? But in our actual lives, and the reason why truthfulness is so important uh, for us is that you're reinforcing either that you're in control or you're not in control. When you lie a lot, even white lie, uh, and we're going to speak about this in practical application, you're reinforcing that you have to morph yourself. You have to uh, divert your natural instincts for the sake of other people liking you. I mean, that's, that's the crux of, of this, right? So the more you can be truthful, truthful with yourself and truthful with other people, the more you're embodying nobility and the more you're reinforcing that you have nothing to fear. And like, I just want to make this bit on, um, I want to say a little bit about vulnerability. Obviously, I'm pro-vulnerability. If you listen to any of my episodes, I'm pro speaking your mind and being truthful. And I'm a fan of Brene Brown. But actually, like, you know, this idea of vulnerability, I think, has been misinterpreted a lot, especially for men or by men. And I'm guilty of this as well. Whereas we take on this idea, this true idea that vulnerability is good, it's true to, uh, to share what's true for you, right? It's, it's, it's a great way to connect. It's a great way to uh, resensitize yourself and... Um, and feel your instincts and, and just be in the world, right? But the fact that people call it vulnerability, is, it's kind of like a, I think it's a misnomer actually, because if you're, if you're well-practiced at being truthful and high fidelity and strong in your truth and bold in your truth and not apologetic in like, hey, this is what's true for me, I'm sharing it with you, it's not actually vulnerable, right? Like you actually, you know, I, I, when, I, when I coach guys in dating, I almost always tell guys to just tell, say what's, what you're actually feeling. If you're nervous, say you're nervous. But it's not saying, oh, I'm nervous on a date to get, you know, to get her to pity you. Like, that's not the point of saying what's true for you. It's just like kind of declaring in a bold way. I know it seems uh, oxymoronic or paradoxical, but like in a bold way saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm so attracted to you that I'm, I'm a little nervous right now. I'm kind of like, you know, I can't think of what to say or I'm, I'm, I'm you know, whatever. You know, by identifying it, by volunteering that information, you're reinforcing into your subconscious, hey, I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to be ashamed about. The slave has plenty to be ashamed about. The noble has nothing to be ashamed about. He's just saying, this is what's true for me. And I'm so, uh, I'm so resilient and strong that I'm going to show you the stuff that maybe other people would be ashamed of. This is really important. Um, and I, so I actually think this idea of vulnerability is like the wrong word because I'm guilty of this as well. When I started to learn the importance of vulnerability, at times, I would interpret this to mean, for my you know slave morality conditioning, that this meant sharing the most pathetic things about myself in a pathetic way, right? I'd be like, "Oh, this is that hurt my feelings, or this or that, or whatever." Like, that's not the thing. That's not the way, right? At times, maybe it's a good stage to just be practiced in. You know, it's, it's obviously better to share what's true for you than to hide and manipulate and like try to morph yourself into a fake facade. But the way that at least men should be vulnerable is not in a supplicating way. It's like, hey, this is what's true for me. Like you can be truthful and high fidelity while being noble, not not being pathetic, right? So I think I see this a lot, especially in younger guys, because I think as slave morality has incepted into our culture, I think mainly do uh, through social media. I speak a lot. I speak with a lot of younger guys who are very introspective or very self-aware are like very much trying to work on themselves and like really putting an effort to work on themselves and grow as, grow as people and grow as men. But they've taken on this idea to an extreme that vulnerability is good. Therefore, I should admit and like reveal every single embarrassing thing about myself and like be like, hey, here, I'm having feelings. Like, look at me, you know, like, which is not the way to be vulnerable. I mean, I just forget the word vulnerability. It's not the way to be truthful. Like you can say, anyway, you get my point. Um, which brings us into our last uh, section here, um, which is, and I'll actually read a quote. I didn't bring the book with me, but uh, there's a quote from this book I'm reading called The Dice Man, which I'm going to do a whole episode on because it's a really trippy book. Um, it's, I'm going to do an episode on the fool and devil archetypes. But there's a quote in that book. It's about a guy who lives his life. Um, instead of thinking, he rolls dice to determine what he does in every stage. And there's this great uh, quote in the book that a man is defined by his audience. Uh, and in, in the book, he's talking about like behavior change and like who you see yourself as 
is determined by what audience you care judges you. And he has, I mean, I don't remember the words exactly, but something like uh, a man is defined by who he thinks is cheering and booing him. So even when you're by yourself, if you're doing stuff and, you, and you're like, oh, this is good and this is bad, good and bad from whose perspective? From someone's perspective, right? You might have forgotten whose perspective that is. Maybe it was your mother or, or your uh, religion or something, but like what you think is good and bad, even when you're by yourself, is based on some external perspective, to some degree at least, right? We, we all have that in us. And in the, in the Dice Man who's speaking about how when a person quickly changes the audience he cares about, he usually goes through an existential crisis. And I experienced this a little bit, or I experienced this on, in some way when I was in the cult. The moment that I knew, uh, looking back, the moment that I was actually in the cult was not when I moved into the house, because I was still very much part of the outside world. I was just trying this weird thing out. It wasn't even the moment that I started giving them money. The moment that I was actually in the cult versus out of the cult was when I started caring more about their opinions than my, my non-cult friends' opinions. When I started going to the mindset of like, my old friends don't really get me, but these like weird cult people, they, they do understand me. Like when I, when I started to believe that, that's when I was in that reality versus the old reality, right? That's when, I, I, my, that's when my personality transformed in mostly a positive way. And you can uh, listen about that in, uh, in my cult episodes. But uh, who you are is determined by the reference group that you care, whose opinion you care about. So the, the most noble reference group and the most not noble audience is, is internal. I mean, to the degree that you're noble is the, the degree that you care mostly about what you think of yourself or to some degree what, what your noble class thinks of you, right? A lot of what honor is is caring about what other people think about you, specifically men think about you, but not all men. The men that you have deemed to be honorable, the men that you've deemed to also be noble. Whereas a slave's audience is everyone else, right? Again, most of us don't have literal masters, but slave morality has like its own in like slave morality for slave morality to exist, there has to be some perception of an external force. So like in modern culture and social media supports this a lot, people care so much about what other people think. They care about, they're, they're treating the collective as their master, right? Like what I do is only good or bad based on how many likes I get or how much support I get from people on social media or you know what my friends will think about me or what these people who are maybe not even my friends but I call them my friends, like what they think about me. If that's how you're living your life, if that's the audience you care about, then you're living in, in the slave archetype more. Um, so anyway, all right, let's bring us to the final section. This episode has been a little bit longer than I meant, but we're going to bring us into uh, the practical application of nobility now. I'll reiterate this definition that came from my buddy, that a noble reality is one, a noble is one who has no separation between will and action. He can directly put his will into action. That is what nobility is. It's a reinforcement that you are the one who has the most influence over your immediate reality. So I'll just run through a couple principles of putting this into play. So a very simple thing to do in, in social situations, and actually as I wrote my list of things I know to be true at 33, a lot of them were like these social things of, I sh oh, I should do this instead of this. A lot of the things that I, uh, I'm i going to stop doing or like, you know, I've been moving away from, but I, I, I still, you know, I'm not perfect. have been things that I've been kind of doing for other people to like me, right? As opposed to doing what I really wanted, right? We all have some level of behavior in this. And a very simple question to ask yourself is with any given activity or any decision, am I doing this for my own instinctual desire, for my own desire? Or am I doing this to be liked by some external group? If it's for your own desire, you're assuming that you are responsible for your reality. If you're doing things for other people like you, you're assuming that they dictate your well-being. Um, and the more you do things for other people, the more resentful you become, ultimately, even if you think you're doing this for, to be a good person or I'm going to do this because I'm a good friend. If you're doing this mainly for their perceptions, you are giving away your power and you're increasing your resentment because it's actually nobody who constantly does things for other people is really happy, right? And actually, uh, Gabor Mate has this great talk on this, on how uh, he gives these, these great, uh, he gives us like this list of examples of how people who are constantly doing things for other people have a higher risk of cancer. And he has all these examples of like the guy who uh, got cancer because he was constantly being selfish, uh, selfless, 
constantly doing things for other people. He had no boundaries and uh, he never expressed anger. And he went into work every day until the day he died from cancer. And people are like, and he has this, um, he points out how a lot of us think like, oh, what an amazing thing. Like what a selfless guy that like to the day he was dying of cancer, he was still spending most of his time to make other people rich. You know, you know, like that's kind of, that, that is slave morality, right? The idea that we would even think that's a good thing or some people would think that's a good thing is, is slave consciousness, is a slave perspective. Whereas you have to serve yourself first. And actually, as Gabor Mate pointed out, uh, if you want to live longer, you need to have boundaries. Like anger is a good thing. Anger is the emotion of, hey, get out of my space. Get out of my survival zone. This is, this is mine so I can survive, right? That's not a bad thing. That's a very good thing. And if you suppress your anger, you're going to be resentful, right? A lot of people, I mean, I'm just saying this for my friends who've been in recovery. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, as I said, you know, a lot of uh, healing from addiction or recovering is dropping resentment. And part of that is having boundaries of not uh, doing things just to be like, because that's going to make you resentful. It's going to make you feel isolated. It's going to make you do bad things bad things according to yourself. So uh, the technique that I that I share in all of my programs, I bring it up in almost in many of my coaching sessions, especially with someone with poor boundaries, or, or, or especially men who maybe have become so apathetic because of doing things for other people that they can't even feel their desire, is the I want exercise, right? The more you can use the phrasing I want, the more you're reinforcing that your desires are valid, is the more you're reinforcing the noble archetype inside of you. Like the king says, I want uh, grilled chicken and someone brings him the grilled chicken. Like he, he's re he just has that belief that whatever he wants, he gets. He's assuming nobility. Whereas if you constantly use the phrase I need or I have to do this, like those phrases are reinforcing that you're subject to someone else. Like, oh, I need to do this thing for my job. Maybe that's true. And, you know, if you are working a corporate job where you're dependent on a salary, yes, you might have, you know, in order to get the salary, you might have to do thing, things you don't want to do. But uh, you don't want to reinforce that reality that you don't have choice, right? It's like, I'm going to do this thing for my boss because I want the salary. At least bring it back to where you have agency because you don't want to reinforce this reality that you don't have control of your reality because that makes you feel shittier. It makes you feel less of a man. It increases your cortisol levels and it may even cause cancer, right? According to Gabor Mate. Second principle sim uh, related is being willing to enter discomfort, right? The, the whole thing of entering tension that my buddy Brian Bijin speaks about all the time, right? The nobleman chooses to enter battle. The nobleman chooses to take on challenges. The nobleman chooses to enter discomfort. Uh, they bring the fight. Because um, that, that's how nobility was earned in the first place. The conquering people are the ones who initiated uh, the tension. And I spoke about this more in the predator versus prey archetype episode. Like the predator is the one who initiates the battle. The prey is always trying to avoid tension. And, uh, you know, so like a lot of nice guys or people who, uh, yeah, people who are running on slave morality will often use like this seemingly moral excuse for avoiding discomfort. Like for instance, the easy example would be like, um, a nice guy has a problem with someone at work or a problem with one of his friends, um, but he's so afraid of avoiding tension that when like someone says like, oh, well, you should probably tell them how you feel, they're like, oh, no, no, that would make them feel bad, right? There's always this like idea that, oh, I'm doing this for other people. Like it would make them feel bad. I'm doing this. I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable by sharing about how they harmed me or they bothered me in some way. But really, as we all know, the, the nice guy is really just trying to avoid his own tension, right? He's using this outside justification of why he should avoid something he's afraid of. That's slave stuff, right? The slave is trying to avoid any discomfort. Um, whereas the noble enters discomfort, right? He's willing to confront anybody because of the fact that he has an assumption he's going to win, right? Or, or at least he's willing to find out if he's going to win because if the nobleman can't deal with confrontation, if the nobleman can no longer win battles, he's no longer deserving to be a man of high rank, right? And yes, I know this maybe is not politically correct, but, but these are the origins of these archetypes. And yeah, we can see in like early societies where the class structure isn't so divided. Like we look at like um, early Germanic tribes or barbarian tribes. Where of course, there was already like a separation between the chiefs and the, the most powerful, the alphas, if you will, and the betas. There was still this perception that if, yeah, we can actually see this in, even in Game of Thrones with like uh, the Dothraki, um, there's a line like, uh, 
uh, a call who cannot ride is no call, right? There's this, this, uh, um, um, there's this assumption that if you're going to be high class, you have to earn it. You have to earn it through competition. Whereas, you know, uh, this has been diluted through the years where, uh, you know, you have these figurehead noble people or you have these families who have are generationally wealthy, even though they're, maybe they're not embodying these strength characteristics anymore. In, in, our, in, in the origins, the people just assumed, like, the chief is a chief because he's the most bad motherfucker in the tribe, right? And he has to keep earning that. If he starts being cowardly, he's no longer worthy, or, or weak, he's no longer worthy of that. So someone who's really embodying uh, nobility is willing, maybe they, they don't assume they're going to win every competition, but they know that they have to compete in order to deserve their place, right? They have to continually do hard things if they're going to be um, deserving of the, their privilege. So this third, uh, this third principle of like practically applying nobility would be, and this is something that I've been working on, right? It's kind of been like a, uh, it has been a paradigm shift for me, which is reducing the realm of what you care about to the zone of what you can uh, influence. And um, even before this recent shift, I haven't voted. I've never actually never voted. I, I try to not get involved in global politics, even though, you know, obviously there's certain things I should know. And a lot of people criticize me for this. But my retort is uh, who I vote for doesn't actually make a difference in the world. There's th certain things in the world that I can affect, right? Like there's, I mean, I could, I'm not going to virtue signal and list all the things that I do for my community. But I, I will say there's things that I do that I actually have a real effect on. And like caring about stuff that's far beyond me, caring about like some of the political discussions or cultural discussions going on in America, like I can't actually affect that. So I stop caring about that. I actually tune all of that out, right? And whether you choose to do that on a, uh, I'm not saying what you should do. I mean, if you if you vote and you're involved in politics and you feel you're making a difference, great, you should do that, right? Definitely do whatever you feel is right. That is the noble way. Um, uh, but to care about stuff that you cannot control, that is slave stuff, right? The more noble you are, the more you, the more you put your attention on what you actually can influence. Um, it's basically, um, doing what you can for where you actually can, anyway, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but only caring about what you can actually uh, influence, caring about your realm of control. If we look at uh, feudalism again, uh, the feudal lords who are most in their nobility, the most, the most extreme of master morality, at least uh, you know, in terms of sociological structure, they didn't really care about anything beyond their estate, right? Uh, they didn't wanna even trade, like they wanted to produce everything in house. And you know, if, you, if you look at this from a social perspective, right? And I, I had this recently with a, a friend um, who, who I had some issues with because of the fact that we had gotten so close. And like, I actually, uh, I'll take it on myself, I started caring a little bit too much about what this friend was doing. Um, we had made certain plans, but it doesn't really matter what the details are, but like, I started becoming resentful. I started becoming disappointed in this friend's character and behavior, but only because I started caring a little bit too much about stuff that was really beyond my business and beyond my control. Whereas, you know, if I was really in nobility, I would not care about anything outside of my family, essentially, right? Like I can influence my family, I can influence my land, the, the parcel of land I live on. I should not care about what my neighbors do, unless it, you know, obviously affects, affects me and my, and my family, right? Um, and it's a lot more healthy of a way to, to live, right? You, you can't be resentful if you don't expect things of people or things that you cannot control. If you only care about stuff that you can control, if you only, if you f take, and take full responsibility for what is within your control, it's just a lot more healthy of a way to live. Which brings us to uh, how you organize your social circle. And this is something that you know, I had to think about a lot as well, and I've spoken about on a more abstract level in the Breaking Social Constructions of Reality episode. <clears throat> Which is, you know, I, I said something. I said something cliche in that episode, like find your tribe. But in applying nobility, is I would say the way to support your own nobility is to only associate with people that are, are also noble in your eyes, right? And so, so to bring this, give an example. When I was living in New York, and I was driving a cab, and I was trying to break back into coaching because I had been coaching for a while. I kind of had an existential crisis. I stopped doing that. Switched to blue collar jobs for a while. As I was like rebuilding my wealth and rebuilding my business and moving out of you know uh, the servitude of blue collar work, uh, which I have a lot of respect for, but it is you know if you're in a blue collar job, unless you're the boss, you are enslaved in some way. Uh, as I was moving out of that and starting to make more money again, 
I noticed that some of the guys I was hanging out with, who regardless of their their wealth, like they were just kind of in a they're kind of in a slave mode, in in a resentful mode. Where I noticed like I didn't want to share with them about my business victories. I didn't want to share. I mean, I, you know, I had some friends who were like I realized like I never wanted. It didn't feel good to share anything positive with them because I knew they were going to be jealous. So what did I would you know? Because I was hanging out with these guys, you know, kind of unconsciously. I would often share bad things, right? I'd often connect on, on negative things. I'd be like, oh yeah, I just got hit with this huge bill or I got another parking ticket. And they'd be like, oh yeah, you know, they would commiserate. Like, oh, I, I have something bad too. And like, we would bond over the slave stuff. We would bond over being mediocre. We would bond over bad news. Whereas the friends that I actually uh, started moving towards more were the ones who would actually celebrate my victories. Be like, oh yeah, fuck yeah, you got this new whatever. Like, oh, here, I got this thing too. Or they would be inspired and, I, and, and their inspiration would inspire me and we'd have this positive feedback loop of raising each other up as opposed to I need to be more mediocre to relate to these mediocre people. And I know this sounds really harsh and, uh, you know, I have some friends who are, you know, I, I don't, you know whatever, actually, I'll, I'll just say, uh, I don't mean to the criticize anyone in particular, but I will, I mean, I'll, you know, I'll criticize anyone who, you know, supports mediocrity or at least I'll call it out if it, if it comes up you know like there we, we unless you're a sociopath you are affected by the people you hang out with right you, you have empathy right that's it's a natural thing so you have to be very clear of who you associate with and who you care about and I just made this decision recently I, I explicitly told myself recently that I don't want to invest in any social relationship any friendship with anyone who whom I feel incentivized to share mediocre things with just to relate to them where I have to coddle them in any way where I can't tell them the truth because they're too sensitive. Like I don't want to deal with that, right? Because that's supporting slave morality, right? I don't want to do that in myself, right? I'm preparing to be a father uh, and you know, I think the best way to be a father is to be as noble as possible. And there's a quote by Nietzsche uh, in terms of, which I, I think applies very well to dealing with trolls or haters or whomever. Um, and he, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but uh, he says something like, a nobleman shrugs off the worms that eat it weaker men. If you care too much about what other people think of you, specifically people who are critical of what you think is right, right? It's one thing if like you're doing uh, shifty, slavish, um, shitty things and a good friend of yours is like, hey dude, you're kind of going down a wrong path or you're kind of doing some fucked up shit. That's one thing, right? But for another person who is critical of your success or critical of your nobility or critical of your good boundaries, let's say, those are people you don't want to you don't want to spend a lot of time with because they're in order to relate to them, you have to make yourself more mediocre. Which brings us to our last thing, and I already mentioned this in the archetype section, which is uh, being high fidelity. I said this already, but it's worth repeating that a nobleman, because of the fact that he assumes he's in control of his reality always tells the truth, right? He has no incentive to lie because he doesn't need to, to morph himself for other people to like him. The nobleman sets the values, right? The nobleman determines for himself what he sees as good and bad. He runs on his own set of ethics, which may also match the ethics of his noble friends, but he certainly does not care about the person who's perhaps resentful at him and criticizing him for how awesome he is, right? And what he determines to be awesome. He doesn't go by what the collective mob thinks is right and wrong, just to fit in, uh, he acts on his own desire. Um, he's true, and, and you know, he's truthful with himself too, right? The the person who is enslaved, you know, the, just this initial introduction of slave morality, where the definition of good has to be switched or, or changed or, or detracted from the from strength, right? Because like I, prior to slave morality, the word good referred to ethical good and competence good, right? Whereas we, we, in, our, in our common language now, there's two definitions of good. You can be, let's say, good at sports, but a bad sportsman, right? If you think of, let's say, Michael Jordan was obviously amazing at basketball, but a lot of people say he was a dick on the court, right? You would say, oh, he's a bad guy. Or, you know, maybe some people would be like, oh, he's, he's bad to play with, but he's a good player, right? He's good in terms of, slave, in, uh, terms of master morality, but he was bad from a slave's perspective because he was being mean, right? Whereas uh, to, to the noble, it's all the same thing. Anyway, this means you have to be truthful with yourself because the slave, because he's detracting from nature, he kind of morphs things and lies to himself by convincing himself, oh, I'm good by being weak, which is not in line with nature. In nature, uh, goodness is strength. 
Um, yeah, and, he, and you know, being high fidelity is not just telling the truth, but is actually acting on your truth. And I'll bring us to our last piece here, because if you're listening to this and, you know, you have some, you know, there's, there's many, it's very easy to criticize everything I'm saying from slave morality, of course, <laughs> but also there's this, this idea, which is true for me too, of like, man, sl- uh, selfishness has gotten a bad rap because selfishness has led to a lot of bad things. Uh, imperialism, which is master morality in action, has led to the oppression of other people. Uh, Nazism is an extreme application of uh, master morality, saying like our our people are the only people that matter. Uh, all these other people we can annihilate, right? Genocide has been uh, supported by master morality. I'm not saying that certainly not on a political level or a sociological level. Certainly master morality is not always a good thing. And even though I think an individual is always served more by acting nobly, according to Nietzsche, rather than ignobly. You could be an asshole. So what is the thing that balances out all of this, right? Um, because we don't want to all become Cersei Lannisters. I assume you don't want to be. I wouldn't want all of us to become that. And this is this idea of noblesse oblige. It's, uh, it's French for the, 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 noble, the nobility obliges, or the obligations of the noble class. And it's not obligations based on the government saying, oh, the rich need to do this for everybody, you have to do this. It's not an obligation of like coming from the church or the priest, the pope says, oh, I need to give away ten- a tenth of my wealth. It's that the noble, the noble him or herself, decides on his or her own, her own volition to care about other people. And this, this idea of noblesse oblige was uh, related to uh, the, the noble class does have responsibilities to the peasant class. And in feudalism, this was protection, right? Um, and in most, you know, I'm not saying that uh, feudalism was uh, fair or necessarily good. Obviously, peasants had terrible experiences. But at least from the nobleman's perspective back then, the equal trade there was that the peasants served the, the nobles, but the nobles physically protected the peasants which at one point was true. Like, um, I mean, this is kind of how mafias uh, start extorting, right? They're protecting the neighborhood, but then they're also forcing the, the people to give them money for that protection, whether they want it or not. The conquerors, the, I mean, the Vikings came in and conquered uh, an agrarian society. Yes, they took it by force, but they also now were responsible for the protection of those agrarians, right? If, other, if another conquering peoples came in, the, those conquerors would have to fight them and protect their, their peasants. So there is a, there's an obligation to the noble, and this is where your, your own conscience comes in. It has to come from your own self. And, you know, I spoke about this in the uh, Abundance Model episode about how there is something purely that just feels good and feels abundant when you're choosing to be generous, right? You're not giving to people because you think God will smite you otherwise. You're not giving to people to virtue signal to the masses. You're giving because it feels good to know that you have more than you need and you want to serve people that maybe don't have as much. It doesn't mean that you reduce your wealth to nothing so that you're as poor as everyone else, but it does mean that you make active choices of this is how I want to make a difference in the world for, for positive change. And that's what's going to make you feel better because if you take this master morality stuff only with selfishness and, and, and think that you and your genetic line are somehow separate from the rest of humanity, that also is isolating. And that will also make you feel resentful and weird, and you eventually will get conquered by, by someone else, uh, as history has shown. Because and I'm going to bring us back to Mufasa. Actually, I, I shared the Lion King thing a little too. I shot my wad on that one. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to bring us back to that because noblesse oblige is best, uh, is best demonstrated by Mufasa's line again. You know, Simba says, well, don't we eat the antelope? And Mufasa says, but when, it, when, when we die our bodies become the grass and the antelopes eat the grass and such is the circle of life, right? Noblesse oblige has an acknowledgement of one's mortality. It's kind of like how uh, when the, the Roman generals had a triumph and you know, parading for their victory and thinking that they're the shit, they had a slave on the float with them reminding them that they're going to die, right? You need to remember your mortality so that you don't think you're a god, right? And that's what um, connects you. I mean... If you take a high dose of mushrooms, for instance, or like a high dose of some psychedelic, you will have that feeling, I think from a noble perspective, that we are all connected, right? doesn't mean you should stop eating meat. doesn't mean that the lion should uh, stop eating antelope. But you can still respect the thing that you're conquering, recognizing that this is the way it is. You know, I'm a predator. 
Uh, there are things that I consume. Um, there are things that I do, I mean, for a more literal uh, application, there are things that I do to serve myself and serve my family, which maybe on some level means that there's less wealth for the competing businesses that I'm fighting against. But that's the way it is. That's just the, the way nature is. It doesn't mean I need to hate or resent or want to harm other people. It's like, this is just the law of nature. And I can still respect people and I can still give people a fair deal. In business, I can still be honest and truthful and noble with people um, while I'm competing with them. I can c compete with my worthy adversaries. Because I, I would say on, on another level, this noblesse oblige is a recognition that we all have our own slave archetype as well. And if you want to take this trippy perspective of like, we live, our consciousness lives many lifetimes, or we are all connected on some immaterial level, even, on the, even though on the material plane we're separate, it gives you respect for other people. So even, you know, this is what allows you to be a gracious winner. Um, this is what allows you to be generous with people that you conquered in some metaphoric way um, and really care about the people that uh, that you have uh, that you have privileges over, right? Doesn't mean you need to give away all of your privileges, but recognizing that you can still be kind and generous, and there are certain perhaps like conscious level or, or we could say heart centered obligations to humanity that you can choose to have that will allow you to feel better and actually will allow you to feel more noble. And I know there's a criticism, there's a Marxist criticism that noblesse oblige has been a way uh, for uh, the privileged people to somehow like, you know, do this conscious, uh, this conscience shift of like, this is why we deserve to be better because we're doing these nice things for people. And I'm not saying that's correct uh, necessarily, but purely from an individual perspective, as you go through life, trying to become more privileged, trying to compete in the free market, compete in the social market um, and become a better person and, and further the benefit, the, further the well-being of yourself and the people under your care. Uh, this concept of noblesse oblige will allow you to not be an asshole, but also feel connected and uh, good. And all of this is about feeling good, ultimately. Uh, last bit, if you want a more active uh, stance or an active way to reclaim the noble barbarian within you, especially if you feel it's been dormant, I have, of course, my 21 day mask and archetype challenge. It's 21 micro lessons and micro missions to summon the your masculine archetype, the testosterone driven characteristics that maybe are dormant in you. I think it's dormant in a lot of guys. And we even have an, um, I even share a meditation, a guided meditation or a guided self hypnosis, if you will, to conceptualize your own inner uh, masculine archetype. And a lot of guys who have spoken to me after doing that, like they, they actually get conceptualized some sort of barbarian. I don't want to put that in your head, but like a lot of people do. Like I do think uh, that is like the, that is the uh, representation of that, that noble archetype within us. And of course it comes with a free coaching session with me. It is the most cost effective way to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. If you join the archetype, you automatically, you join the archetype challenge, you automatically get a, a link to my scheduler to book a call with me, and I'm happy to work on any of this stuff with you, uh, specific to your life, whether it's in dating or your life purpose or whatever. And on the flip side of that, if the first part of this episode was particularly interesting to you, the historical origins of these uh, noble traits, um, you might want to check out my History of Masculinity series, which is coming out later this year. I know I've been talking about this for months, but honestly, it's been such a, I mean, I've had to read so many books and do so much research to do justice to the history of masculinity and the history of warfare. So it's not going to be out for a bit, but I am going to do a soft uh, launch uh, to whoever opts in. So you can, you can go to historyofmasculinity.com, just put in your email, and that'll let me notify you, and you'll get free access to the series before anyone else. That's at historyofmasculinity.com. And my archetype challenge is at rwando.com archetype. Thanks for listening. Be noble. Goodbye.